Okay, our next, our next speaker is, uh, I believe, a product of Skeptic Camp that this talk uh, was prepared for. Um, got great reviews, and that's why we, we're going to welcome Andrew Hansford. Uh, he has a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. Uh, his work involves video and thermal imaging for the military and aerospace industry, and he's also an aviation enthusiast and member of the Granite State Skeptics. So please welcome some good old-fashioned debunking. Uh, his talk is titled, The Marblehead UFO, What You Can Learn From Your Armchair. Please welcome Andrew Hansford. Can you hear me yet? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Marblehead UFO, what you can learn from your armchair. On the 26th of October in 2011, Ian Warren, an allergist and semi-professional photographer, and I say semi-professional because he does sell his photography online, uh, went to Preston Beach in his hometown of Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts, uh, to capture images uh, near and around sunrise. Uh, are they up? Can you see them there? And, you know, this is a fantastic image. We have an old anchor in the front sitting on a beach in the same frame as an island off uh, in front of the sunrise. Meanwhile, we have a very unusual cloud situation. There's clouds overhead, but there's a cloud break in the distance. So we have light streaming in underneath the clouds, and the clouds to the east of this location are lit up from beneath. So remember some of those details will be um, important, and it's hard to go back. But while he was processing his photographs, he noticed a white speck in the left side of several of the shots. Can you see the speck? It's, it's sometimes hard to see. Now, he, he says that the speck stayed there for a while in one position and then sped off to the right. So he put together 10 of these frames and put this up on his blog, zoomed in on just the area we see, and this is the result. As you'll see, in the first few frames, it doesn't move too much, stays about where it is, and then moves rapidly off to the right. Now, one of the problems with this animation is it's 10 frames, but we don't know the actual interval between when the photographs were taken. We don't know how long each exposure of, uh, of this is. So it's really hard to tell what the precise uh, movement of the object was. But it looks, does look like there's definitely an object moving over Massachusetts Bay that morning. Now, this story was picked up in, in uh, the local paper after he posted uh, this animation in, in the photograph. And, you know, it was hyped up, you know, defies easy explanation. Well, to me, it looked like an airplane, you know, in the distance, lit up from the side because that's what airplanes look like uh, in, at uh, sunrise or sunset. They're lit from the side and off the top. But the unusual situation here is there's clouds over, over it. But, you know, with only a single photograph, what information can we gather about this to support that argument? It's, it's, a, it's an airplane. We can just say, hey, you know, that's an airplane. What are you talking about, guy? Or we can say, well, Occam's razor says the simplest explanation, that's an aircraft of some sort. But that's kind of, doesn't really leave us where much to go. But, but what do we do? What do we say? Do we just shrug it off? Do we let other people speculate that this is possibly alien activity, or maybe a secret military weapon, <laughs> or perhaps even something more spiritual in nature. <laughs> well, so let's start with what we have. The photographer's account. Now this is from the photographer's blog and photo blog. And we see, and it's hard to see, but he says, hey, he woke up in the morning, it was 6.30, he looked at the sky, looked great. He wanted to take this kind of a photograph. And he says, uh, once I was there, I shot dawn light exposure of the anchor and brilliant sky. In order to, uh, to capture the incredible dynamic range in the scene, I actually took, he says, six images in this paragraph at shutter speeds ranging from 1 8 to a full eight seconds. In the next paragraph, he says he has 16 exposures that each took as little as a half a second and, and a, to a full eight seconds. He combined those and put those in, in, into his um, animation. So now we have the local story um, 
by Amy Stallsman in something called Wicked Local, which is uh, covering in um, the Marblehead area. And the title of the story was UFO Marvel Recent Sightings Defy Easy Explanation. This uh, article had it all except for baffled scientists. And what we get here is this is great. We get that the ph uh, photographic timeline starts at 6.58.36, according to, to Oren, and extends out to 7 a.m. So now we have a pretty precise time about where the animation took place and what, where that, uh, the photographs were taken. So, Preston Beach and Marblehead, now where is it? So, uh, first image there you'll see is Massachusetts Bay, and Marblehead is north of Boston, what they call the North Shore. And as we, zo as we zoom in, we can see there's the island uh, in, the, in the middle image. Uh, that's called Ram Island off of uh, Preston Beach. And we zoom into the beach, and you can see uh, the rock formation. Now, that's where the anchor is. The red marker is where I was first trying to place the camera. The green marker is actually where uh, the photographer said that's where he set up his tripod. Uh, he gave me that information in an email exchange when I was first proposing this. And that's the uh, place we'll use for further analysis. So what was the atmospheric uh, conditions like then? Well, we go to the NOAA solar calculator at, at this URL, and we find out that sunrise at this location on that date, uh, October 26, 2011, was 7.09. So the photographs were taken about 10 minutes before actual sunrise. So the light in is glare from, from the sunrise, but not actual sun rays yet. Now we get an extra bonus from this. The green line graph is the, the angle of the sunrise from the, lo, from the location. And if you'll notice, that angle goes right over the anchor, which is the center of the photograph. So we can use this line as the approximate uh, center line of where the camera was pointing. So now we know where the camera was, pretty much where it's pointing. All right, so how about those clouds overhead? That object must be beneath the clouds. There's, it can't be above the clouds if it was in those clouds pretty much covered to the horizon going south, so it can't be too far south. It looks like it's right over the bay. So how do we know how high those clouds are? Well, every airport issues a weather report every hour. And these are called METAR. So I went to this website at the Plymouth State to get the historic METAR data for that day. And for KBOS, which is the, uh, uh, for Boston Logan Airport, we see, at, and you'll say time was 1054. Well, what's that 1054? METARs are li listed in UTC. So UTC is four hours in advance of Eastern Daylight Time. So this weather report actually came out at 6.54 a.m., four to 10 minutes before the animation photograph. So this is fairly fresh data. And all these numbers, what comes down translated to is, yeah, it was 49 degrees. We had light winds from the west. Now, the last column you see is coverage. It was overcast. And the next to last one, you say the ceiling. That's where the bottoms of the clouds were. 70, that's in hundreds of feet. Those clouds were at 7,000 feet. That object must be below 7,000 feet. So, if I think it's a plane, what planes were in the area? Well, this is one of my favorite sites to look at, at, at planes. It's called Passure.com. They're an independent company that sells um, tracking data of aircraft to airliners and to airports. And several airports around the country, not just Boston, uh, pay for this service and put it up on, on web pages so you can see live radar of, of, of the aircraft in the area uh, going in and out of, the, uh, of that airport and also transiting over the area. And what's nice about this, not only do you get live, but it has about two weeks of history. Now this was one of my first mistakes. I didn't capture the history for that day before it was erased. But the, here you can see an, an example. And what we have is the planes leaving that airport are in green, the planes going into the airport are in blue, we have black airplanes that are transitioning, and you can select a, an individual craft, it'll turn it red, 
And what, what the information it gives us, it gives us the flight ID, you know, the airline and flight number. It gives us the aircraft type. It gives us the current speed and altitude of that aircraft. It tells us where the aircraft originated its journey and where it's going on it in the end. This is a great site. It's fun to watch the planes here. I use it all the time to, 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 to see, oh, I wonder what that plane is. So using this tool, I identified this particular flight. JetBlue Flight 1250. It left Dallas uh, at 6 o'clock a.m. and was into Boston at 7.09 a.m. Now, the great thing about FlightAware, and some of you might have seen it on the news uh, recently, was that it gives you a, all the information about a particular flight, including the ground track, which you can zoom in on, which I set, zoomed in on here over Massachusetts. But it also, on the bottom, you can see it shows a profile of the altitude and speed of the, of the flight for the entire flight. And what you'll see here, that this JetBlue Flight 1250, its ground track takes it over Massachusetts Bay, it turns to its left, flies almost directly at the beach on the, on the North Shore, so it would appear to an observer standing there that it was moving very little, like something coming at you straight like this, turns left to make final into runway 27 in Boston, and then move something like that. So this is an Embraer uh, ERJ 190. So here's what we have so far. We have where the camera's pointing and the flight of this aircraft that, that matches what we would expect the motion to match. But there's one question left. Will this aircraft, if it's on that flight path, be in the field of view of the camera? Now we could examine the pictures and try to look, you know, if we measure it here and do some Google Maps, but there's a simpler way. The camera field of view can be determined very simply that if you know what is known as the focal length, and that's the distance between the objective lens and the imager, and the size of the imager, some simple tri trigonometry will tell you the field of view of the camera. And what and so this imager, and it used to be a piece of film, and now it's a piece of electronics. And you're saying, okay, well, but that's a, this is a compound uh, uh, a lens system, but there's still something called the effective field of view. But where do I get these numbers? Well, every photograph has metadata stored in it and called, called EXIF data. And this is extra non, uh, non image related data that's stored there by originally by the camera and also by any tool that you use to open up the, the picture. Now, a lot of times this uh, uh, metadata is removed on the web, but on this picture that we saw up front, it was still there. And I used this uh, website, the regex.info exif CGI, fed it to that, and it spilled out that this picture was taken with the Canon EOS 50D. It tells me the serial number of that camera. It tells me that the lens used was an EF S15 55 uh, millimeter lens. It tells me that this uh, particular picture was taken on the camera time um, at uh, 6.58. It tells me that the ISO was 100, that this exposure was 2, and yes, the focal length is 33 millimeters. It tells me the focal length. Okay, it didn't tell me what the size of the imager was. But it does tell me what the camera is. It's a Canon EOS 50D. You say, you search, do a web search on Canon EOS 50D Imager, and you get a lot of technical information about the piece of silicon in there, including its size, which is 22.3 millimeters wide. So plugging in the 33 millimeters focal length, 22.3 millimeters wide image, you get a 37.3 degree field of view. That's what the camera was looking at. So we combine all this. Here, here is a our marker of where the camera was and approximately where it was pointing. We overlay the flight path of the aircraft and then we put on the field of view. And we see that the aircraft's flight path intersects the field of view. This is the aircraft. Now, Airliners.net has this huge database of aircraft imagery like this. Now, I don't know if this is the exact aircraft because uh, 
JetBlue only keeps that data around for 90 days, and I didn't even think to ask the people I know at JetBlue until a year and a half later. But this is an ERJ uh, 190 in JetBlue uh, livery. This uh, database here, you can look up almost any type of aircraft for any type of uh, any air force or any airliner, and you can uh, search for any location. If you know the specific registration number or tail number of an aircraft, you can look up that individual aircraft uh, in this database. As a matter of fact, last week I looked up a, a photograph at San Francisco of Air Asiana, the same exact aircraft taking off from San Francisco a couple years ago. But what we know is this plane, it's painted white, so it would be more reflective, was over Massachusetts Bay that morning. We know that this aircraft not only was over Massachusetts Bay, it was over Massachusetts Bay at the right time. We know it was over Massachusetts Bay following a flight path that would explain the motion we saw in the photograph. We know that this flight path intersected the field of view at the right time when the camera was taken. This aircraft, should be in that photograph. And if it's not that white dot, then JetBlue is missing an airplane. <laughs> and that's what I posted on the blog site, Wednesdays in Marblehead, for this, uh, for this photograph. Uh, if you want to check out some, some great photography of, of a coastal New England town, uh, Wednesdays of Marblehead is the photographer's uh, website. He was uh, cooperative in my investigation. I'd like to thank uh, Reed for getting me, making me commit to this uh, uh, presentation. I'd like to thank the Granite State Skeptics and the Cape Band Skeptics for letting me do this presentation for them. I'd like to thank Captain Michael Robbs and Dr. Stuart Robbins for their input and feedback. Thank you, Professor Hall. Thank you, Jay Raff, for the opportunity to do these papers. Thank you, James Randy, for everything. And thank you guys for showing up early on a Sunday morning to hear this. Remember, the truth is out there. And you can find it. Well, thank you, Andrew. And we have time for a couple questions. Kitty. Uh, I'm just here to show you that I did wake up on a Sunday morning and show up for your talk like I promised. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, anybody wants to show some love? Do you have any issues with the, uh, this is an excellent investigation, but do you have any, any problems explaining to people with the density of information? And how do you, how do you, do you, do you have, do you have to like simplify things sometimes for people who kind of tune you out after a while? Um, well, I think this particular case was fairly straightforward. Uh, you know, you have one light over a, a, a a, in the image at a time. It was, it was very simple. It lined up exactly with an, an airplane that was in the area. Uh, so this one, no. If, this, if I looked on the database and saw that there was no planes in the area that explained that dot, I probably would have just went, well, don't know what that is, and moved on. Any other questions? Well, another round of applause for Andrew and his Thank efforts. You.